Good morning. I'm glad you chose to come out in this cool weather to worship the Lord. Uh, I've been looking forward to being here uh, ever since Jim called and asked me if I could fill in. So uh, thank you all for putting up with me today, and uh, we'll have a good time. It's, it's an honor to me to be able to do so. Um, I know that uh, pastors guard their pulpits closely as they should, and so I consider it an honor that he'd allow me to stand in his and, and preach this morning. Uh, <clears throat> this morning I want to uh, share with you, and uh, if I had to give it a, a title, uh, it would be A Savior Worth Having. Do you have a Savior? Is your Savior worth having? What qualifies Him to be your Savior? We'll talk about some of those things this morning, but uh, if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 18. So in the first service, I kind of had to make myself be on a leash with a little help from the back because I had to make sure everybody's out in time to go to Sunday school, but see, y'all are in trouble. <laughs> I can just let it off the chain now and do it. <clears throat> anyway, Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Uh, I'll invite you, if you're willing and, and desire to, stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word, and then we'll move forward. <clears throat> How many of you would rather be in the hospital? All right, just checking. <clears throat> Verse 18 says, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them for His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what He has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless. Their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles, Therefore God delivered them over in their desire of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of Your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, despite what our society, our world, uh, would like people to believe about God, human history began with knowing God first. The Big Bang, uh, or evolution, or whatever you want to label it, man didn't evolve from nothing and then create a God to worship and call Him Creator. It's the very opposite. God created man. He created Adam and Eve. He created everything we know. The planet He talks about here, uh, just His creation makes it evident of who God is. But He created those things and He put Adam and Eve in that garden. And He did what? He worshipped. He fellowshiped with them, did He not? He walked with them. He talked with them. He fellowshiped with them. He was their God. They were created by God in His image to live for eternally in fellowship with Him. However, man, He gave man a choice, did He not? He, we well, he still have a choice on whether we choose God or not. He gave man a choice and He had told Adam and Eve, do not eat from that tree. Remember? Don't eat from the tree. <clears throat> so, they had the option of just being obedient and worshiping God. But do you recall what took place? They stood under that tree and Satan spoke to them and said, "What? Well, surely God 
not going to kill you if you eat from this tree. Because he know if you if you eat from this tree, then you'll be like God yourself. Adam and Eve, and I'm not blaming Eve because Adam was right there. They eat from that tree, and in doing so, their choice was what? Not only sin, but they chose to worship themselves first. Self. Self became first. So when you think about that, they, they traded in the Creator for the created that we see right here in Romans. They, they chose not to continue to worship the Creator. They chose to worship themselves and become gods themselves in their own minds. Are they not? Did, that, did Adam and Eve suddenly become eternal? Did they become divine? Did they live forever? Are they still here? No, they're gone, they're dead, they're in the grave, right? Why? Because they're human. They were created being by a creator. And their, the punishment, if you will, the consequences of their choices was death. A consequence that continues today for you and I. As God's created beings, we have a consequence that lays before us because we are sinful creatures. Without Christ, we're headed to hell, right? According to the Word, John 3, 16, 17, 18. If you don't choose me, the choice is already made for you, right? But if you choose Christ, then you can have eternity with Him. But see, they chose that, choosing to worship, to try to worship themselves. They traded the truth for a lie because the devil did what to them? He deceived them. He lied. He's the father of lies. He always lies. He continues to lie. He continues to lie to people today and they buy into the, the lies of Satan and believing things that are in this world and what the world produces and says that this is... This is what you should do. This is what you should worship. But see, the problem is, we were created, really not a problem, it's a good thing, we were created in the very beginning to worship. We were created to fellowship with the Creator. He put that within our hearts. He did not take that out. You look into society today, no matter where you go, no matter where you are on the planet, no matter who you talk to, they are seeking salvation, seeking to worship something or some one even if you was to go and you say well what about a, an atheist they don't want to believe in anything or an agnostic who are they worshiping the one in the mirror it's all about me it's all about me putting their trust and their faith in themselves what about universalism in our society you think about just some of the things that are out there today universalism says that every religion has its value so you can just kind of do a little bit of everything I don't know about you, that doesn't work for me. A little bit of everything. Our Buddhist. Well, we don't have, that's not an issue around here, is it? Buddhism, is that an issue around here? No? How many of you have been in a donut shop and seen Buddha sitting in the corner over there? Our nail station, ladies, where you get your fingers done. All that stuff. Well, who's in there? They're a little idle, right? So is he here in America? Is that here in America? And you know what Buddhism worships? They, their belief in Buddha, now that's their little statue, but their belief system is upon a guy that, uh, named Buddha that supposedly lived somewhere between the 4th and 6th century. They're not real sure. But that's who they're going to worship and follow, right? Buddhism. What about uh, Confucian or Confucius, the philosophy of the Chinese philosopher? You're going to put your trust in another human? Anybody ever got bad advice from somebody? Anybody? You ever, got, you ever give any bad advice? What, why would we put our trust in someone that was created? That's what that is. Chinese philosophy. They, they, we, we go to the Chinese food place and we get a little fortune cookie at the end. We break it open and read a little deal and laugh about it, right? There are, there are folks that live and die on what they see in those things. Not just the fortune cookie, but in that philosophy that's provided by someone. Hinduism. We don't see a lot of that, do we? You realize it's one of the fastest growing in the world? Hinduism. Based, it's not based on any one person, but it's a, 
a, a blending of spiritual and cultural traditions uh, and concepts based in India, basically, but it's spread throughout the world. I will say this, they're faithful in their worship of a false god. There's idols everywhere in India. They stop and they light candles and they worship a false god. Really, they're worshiping a concept, a thought. I, I, I'd like to worship somebody, right? Islam or Muslim. But we hear that and everybody comes. Why? Because we see a lot of evil attached to that, do we not? We see a lot of evil in our world attached to that. But I mean, let me say this on the, on the flip coin before I talk about it a little bit. You, you see a lot of evil attached to Muslim, but there's a lot of really passive Muslims that make good neighbors. However, they believe in Muhammad, who got the, the last real revelation, so that's what they follow. You know where Muhammad is? Anybody? You know where he's at now? He's in a grave somewhere. You know what he was? Con man, drug addict, list could go on. And they'll say, well, he, they believe in, in, in the same God. The Allah just means God. Well, let me tell you, my friend, if you've never read any of what they believe in the Koran, that ain't my God. That's not the Creator. That's not the one we find in this book. Muslim is the fastest growing religion on the planet. There are countless tribal beliefs spread all over the world. You know, we live in a, a modern society here in the Western world. But there are places in this world that are secluded unto themselves and don't see outsiders, don't welcome outsiders, do not allow outsiders to come in. And they have their own belief system, whatever they've developed in their mind, to worship, whether it be a sun, a tree, a cow, a goat, or whatever. A lot of that is there. That's why that Christmas child program is really neat. It reaches some of those places. But that's a short plug for me. <coughs> Witchcraft or voodoo. Just some, I'm just throwing a few things out there. Witchcraft or voodoo. That's not just something in the movies, my friend. It's for real. And it's here in America. It's all over the world. And that's, that's Satan with a disguise. A lot of popularity. If, you, if you're not careful, you don't pay attention, it's filtered into a lot of TV to include cartoons mystical stuff what do you think that is magical stuff what is all that that's not from the word word tells us to watch out for that satanism do I, I don't I even go there do I need to talk about that one Greek mythology a myth all it is Mormonism the teachings of Joseph Smith is another group that's decided that Joseph Smith received a uh, final revelation and wrote his own little book that goes to a, an addition to the Bible. But they don't read the Bible, they just read that part. And they follow him. I'm not sure about you, but the end of my Bible says don't add to or don't take away. So they're following this man, Joseph Smith, who, by the way, is in the grave. They're following those things. Last but not least, we think about and there, the list, we could stand here for hours and talk about all the different crazy beliefs in the world today. But the last one I want to throw in front of you is probably the most applicable in a church, Christian church. And that's the worship of self. Well, I, I, I'm immune from that. I'm, I'm not going to worship myself. Adam and Eve were, built, were created perfect, right? Did they mess it up? We're in trouble, aren't we? Self. Self, trusting in our own self is probably more common than we will admit. 
the illusion that we're in control of our life. How many of you like to be in control? Well, there's a third of you telling the truth. We like to be in control, or at least we like to think we can control what's happening in our life. And unfortunately, when you think about the worship of self, because when you worship, you're, whatever you put first and foremost in your life, whatever you spend the most time, money, and effort, that's what you're worshiping. Whether it's baseball, or whether it's tied to the back of your truck, guys, headed to the lake on Sunday morning, or to the deer stand on Sunday morning, or it's in your purse, ladies, that credit card you're headed to the store to go shopping, or whatever that is, the list could go on. And it doesn't matter It's not what it is, because there's nothing wrong with baseball, fishing, hunting, uh, shopping. There's nothing wrong with those things, but it's what place it has in our life. When we allow it to be first in our life before God, it has become our own idol. Well, I don't worship idols, preacher. Well evaluate and see what you're giving the most of your time and effort to. Because if it's not God, then whatever it is, is stepped in front of Him. What are you worshiping? People around the globe, whether they realize it or not, they're seeking salvation to worship a someone or something, an object, if you will. Case in point, Acts. You remembered Paul. He goes into the city of Athens. And he's, he's walking around the city and he's, he's preaching and teaching. And he begins to observe what's taking place. And he sees all these different idols all over. And then there's this one idol that says to the unknown God. So they're just worshiping everything and hoping they get the right thing, right? Paul says, let me tell you about this unknown God. Let me tell you about the one that counts. People seek to worship something. You know why we do? Because we were made that way. You were made that way. The same way, how many of you have gone without eating this week? Have you eaten since yesterday? Have you eaten since last week? Why? We were created that way, right? To hunger, we need to feed ourselves. Our spirit needs to be fed. What are you going to feed it? That's the question. Are you going to feed it something we've discussed already, one of these other belief systems? Are you going to feed it? Feed your spirit the truth? What is the truth? The truth is a true Savior. Satan's got a smorgasbord out there for us to look at, right? And how much of our society is blinded by that? But very simply, <laughs> I want us to think about something. The true Savior. If you were to have need of a new roof on your house, would you hire a plumber to do it? Or a roofer? A roofer. Why the roofer, not the plumber? A roofer's qualified. He has experience. He knows what he's doing in, in doing roofs. You don't need a plumber. You need a Savior. What qualifications does your Savior have to have? What are those qualifications? You ever thought about that? If I'm going to if I'm going to choose Jesus as my Savior, what are my expectations of him? Eternity. Let me let me share a little little story with you and we're going to come back to this a couple of times. You remember Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are headed into the temple to pray. About 3 in the afternoon, if you will. And there's a lame man who, since birth, about 40 years old now, they bring him to the gate beautiful, they set him there, and he takes his little tin cup and rattles it for money every day. So everybody knows this guy. How many of you have seen the homeless in, in Riverside wandering about? Most of us have. Why? Because we see them out and about. This guy sat by the gate of the city for 40 years. Peter and John come by, and he's, he's rattling for alms or whatever, and Peter and John stop, and they say, look, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I got, I'm going to give you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he reached down and grabs him by the hand and he picks him up. And his legs, it says his legs are strengthened and he begins to leap and jump about. Now, I don't know about you, but God can do that. He's got my attention. He he didn't just make him walk and he knew how at one time. He never walked. Never. He didn't have to relearn. He had never learned the first time. I don't know how many of you that have children and grandchildren, but there wasn't a single one of them hit the ground walking. They had to learn, right? But see, God went beyond just giving him strength. He gave him balance and ability to walk. And he, he went about jumping and singing and praising, and everybody in the city saw it. That's the kind of God I want. What about you? Think about those qualifications. How about, do you want a God? Because some of the ones we've talked about earlier, I made a point to make sure you knew they were in the grave, right? How old does your God need to be? 100 years? 200? 300? I want my great-grandma to make sure she was able, right? How about you? What about somebody who's been, always has been? That's a pretty good qualification if you ask me. I want a God that always has been. He wasn't created. He didn't just show up all of a sudden and say, Oh, you know what? i got a new revelation. It's me. That's not a God, is it? My God always has been. What about one that created everything? For the life of me, <laughs> I cannot understand worshiping a created thing. I look in the Old Testament and, and I go back to Exodus and here's God delivered the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, Right? Delivers them out of Egypt, takes them out in the desert, it carries them across the, the, the sea, drowns the army behind them, feeds them manna from heaven. All these things are taking place, and they get to the, the base of the mount, and Moses goes up to talk to God, and he's gone for a little bit too long. Well, he, is he coming back? He's gone for about a month. So that, what do they do? All right, ladies, give me all your jewelry. We're going to melt and make us a golden calf so we can worship. I, that's it, Jody. I just, I don't get it. I, I'm going to worship some melted down earrings. How about you? Do you understand? The, the, that's the same picture today when, we, when people seek to worship things. I want to worship the Creator. The one that said, breathe. And you breathe. The one that said, let there be light and there's light. The one that said, let there be foul in the air and the air was full of birds that's the kind of God I want that's the kind of Savior I'm looking for how about you, does that, that meet a qualification for you what, what about one who, who didn't have to go to the seminary doesn't have to read books, he's not a philosopher I can go to him with questions and he doesn't have to say hang on just a minute let me check my library and look it up in a book because you know what God knows it all he don't have to research the answer. Because He knows. Not only does He know what you need to know, He knows tomorrow. He knows the day after tomorrow. He knows the very day that you'll come see Him. I love Psalms 139. You never read it? You need to. Before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, God Almighty knew you and had a plan for you and numbered your days. You're His. He created you. Now, that's the kind of God I can deal with. How about you? Does that meet a qualification for you? does me. What about uh, someone, not someone who did something mystical or strange or just caught my attention and everything is secret? You know, there's so many religions that are secretive. You don't get to know everything about the Mormons until you in there so long and you go so far. Same thing with Islam. Same thing with Hindu. You, you progress in what they let you know. You know what? God said, come to me. He reveals and He teaches. He said, I'll give you my spirit to teach you the Word. He wrote us a love letter that we could spend our entire life reading and still not understand everything in it. He give us the truth.
I need a Savior that's everlasting. Man, how about a Savior that's in the grave? Can you grasp that either? That's kind of like worshiping the little melted earrings for me. Why am I going to worship somebody's dead? I want a God that's everlasting, that lives forever, that's going to be there forever. Because if I want eternity, I want to live forever. I certainly need a God that's going to live forever, don't you? Because that's where I want it. That's eternity for me. That's heaven is where He is. How about... (laughs) Man, I love this one. How about a God that knows you individually and personally? You know, the preacher might forget your name. If you're this one, you will. Jim probably really good at it, but I'm not. People will forget your names. God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows when your heart hurts. He knows when you're sad, when you're glad, when you're confused. He knows everything about you individually. And my word says that when I step from this place to the next, if I know Him as my Savior, He says, if I go away to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to get you. Because see, when I die, you know the first face I'm going to see? My Savior. Jesus. He said, I'm coming back to get you. That's the kind of Savior I like. A personal one, right? What about a Savior that's impartial? You know, maybe I'm not committed enough for God to love me. Think about some of the other religions we talked about. If if, if you don't meet up to a certain criteria of performance, then you're not accepted. See, my God's not performance-based. He loves me. He's grace and mercy and love and kindness. And I serve Him because I love Him not for Him to love me. He loved me when I was unlovable. He doesn't show partiality. I don't have to have a certain amount of money. I don't have to be perfectly physically healthy. I don't have to be the smartest person on the planet. It doesn't matter about this. He doesn't show partiality. He loves me. You know, we like to think sometimes we're special. And I say that because, and for a long time I battled this. Having spent 30 years in the prison system. Jody, you, you, you understand me. I look at those guys that's and ladies in the prison that's done some of the most unimaginable things on the planet. And I'll leave it at that. My Jesus died for them to come to know Him as Savior just like He did those that were born with a silver spoon on the front row of the Baptist church. He doesn't show partiality. He died for the whole. For God so loved what? Mm. I fit in that group, do you? No partiality. I need a Savior who can talk to me individually. Aren't you glad that you don't have to go to the priest to get your sins confessed even in the day in the old in the old testament they had to go to the priest and the priest went into the holy and the holy of holies and those things jesus did away with that i can talk to him myself i did this morning how about you Ooh. did you talk to jesus this morning well that's a few more of you (laughs) my jesus is never too busy for me. You call my phone, 
I might be busy mowing the yard and I might not answer. I might be busy rearranging my sock drawer and not answer. You follow? But I call Jesus, I call on His name every time He's right there. That's the kind of God I need. That's the Savior I'm looking for. I'm looking for one who's omnipresent that can be at my house and he can be at Ruby's house and Jody's house and Petey's house. He can be everywhere. He can be at my friend Peter's house in Uganda this morning the same time he's here with us, no matter where we're at. Time and space does not contain the God I serve. That's the kind of God I need. The one that no matter where I go, I don't have to send him a message and like I do the bank when I travel. I don't have to, hey, you know, I'm going to be out of country. I'm going to be over here. So can I spend my money when I get there? I don't have to do that. I, God knows where I'm at because He goes with me. That's the kind of God we need. One that is omnipresent, that is everywhere, all the time, every present, <clears throat> all-knowing, unchanging, eternal, sovereign, infinite, self-sufficient. Man, I'm glad my God doesn't have to go for help. He don't have to go get help. He's all that we need. He's it. He's all that we need. He's perfect. He's personal. He's holy. Righteous. Is that a pretty good track record? Just a few things? Would that meet your qualifications if you're looking for a Savior? Would that fit the bill for you? It does for me. Uh, and we can move a step further. What about lives that have been changed? Anybody in here had their life changed when they met Jesus? Anybody have a story to tell of what Jesus did in their life? Jim shared a good one this morning. That's, that's one of deliverance. He's got a story to tell. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you've got a story to tell. That's a witness as to who He is. Hmm. Anybody ever had Jesus wipe the tears from your eyes in moments of grief and sadness and brought joy in times that didn't make sense to be joyful? That's the kind of Jesus we need to look for. That's some qualifications that meet, if you will. What about just, we, look in, we can look in Scripture at a few things has, our, has Jesus as a Savior been successful? Well, first of all, He created everything. We see He changed water to wine. He walked on water. He commanded the seas. He uh, healed the sick. He, he raised people from the dead. Man, I love that. Hey, Lazarus, come here. Here He come. Good thing He called by name. There might have been a crowd. Not only was Jesus able to heal the sick and raise the dead, cast out demons, but there's not another person or proclamation of a God or a Savior ever that can make this statement. Jesus had the power to lay His life down and pick it up again on His own. He went to the cross. They thought they were killing Him. He just gave His life. Thought they were putting Him away in a tomb to stay forever and He guarded it just to make sure. And He said, coming out. I'm done. I'm finished. Sins are paid for. And He's alive today. There's not a single belief system in the world that makes that claim. Jesus doesn't just make that claim. He did it. It's history. It's not a future. It's a history. It's happened. That's the kind of Jesus I have. Those are some qualifications when you start thinking about a Jesus. Who have you put your trust in? I, I encourage you just very simply, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, what qualifications do you want for a Savior? Measure it up. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Here's a story. Of, man, I ain't even got to my third point. <laughs> Sorry, I'll hurry. I, th- I may have told this story here. There was a, quote, atheist, 
speaking at this college. He gets through talking and he stands up there boastfully and proud and and he had made some comments about God and God didn't exist. He was really talking about how atheists had it all together. And some of the students were asking questions and they were just ooh and ah and over this guy that spoke. Suddenly an older gentleman in the back wearing his cleaning uniform because he worked on the cleaning staff there at the college, stood up, rattling an old paper sack. Reaches in there and he pulls out an apple and rubs it off. And he said, got a question. He says, yes, what is your question, sir? He said, is this apple sweet or sour? He says, I don't know, I've not tasted it. You've never tasted Jesus either, so you don't know Him. Do you know Jesus? Now, last thing I want to share with you, and I'll do it quickly. Anybody hungry? Kind of been aiming at an unbeliever, but I don't want to let the Christians off the hook this morning. Acts chapter 4. After Peter and John had spoken the name of Jesus and and raised the man up and he walked and everybody in town was seeing it. Uh, There had been quite the crusade taking place. About 5,000 come to know Christ as their Savior. I would have loved to have been there that day. I would have loved to have seen that. Boy, I'd like to see a crusade like that today. About 5,000. Well, all of the religious leaders and high priests, the ones who took Jesus to the cross, they're all gathered together and they're conspiring again. What do we do with these guys? What are we going to do with these guys? They have caused quite the turmoil. Not only have they caused the turmoil, but we can't dispute seeing the lame man walking around. How do we do away with this? What do we do with that? Thousands are coming to to Jesus. You know, today, in society, if you get too loud for Jesus, will it cause a turmoil? In some places. Do you find opposition? If you don't find opposition in sharing the gospel of Jesus, then my goodness, why aren't we just spending every day, all day doing it? It's out there, right? Right? They were finding such opposition. Unfortunately, I'm going to say this, and you may not believe me or not. Or not. It doesn't matter. Unfortunately, we see some of that same turmoil in churches because of unbelief. We like to put God in our own little box. And if God does something outside that little box, wait a minute, what's going on here? What if there had been a lame man laying by the door of the church the last 40 years and suddenly he's up jumping and walking around? Oh, we'd be shouting, but then we'd be like, did he have surgery or something? We we giggle, but there's some truth to that. We want to explain it away in some other fashion instead of just praising God for doing what God does. But here's Peter Peter and John. All those religious leaders says, well... We've got to do something, so we're going to call these guys in and threaten them. Well, okay, a threat, so what? Well, this is the same bunch that crucified Christ. So it would be a legitimate threat, if you ask me. Calls them in to threaten them. Peter had told them, he said, Only by the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, By Him this man is standing here before you healthy. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which they must be saved. That's pretty clear if you ask me. He's it. The one and only. The one and only. Well, they order them to be quiet about Jesus. Don't don't speak about things in His name any longer around here. You can do whatever you want to do, just don't talk about in the name of Jesus around here. You ever been to a ball game where they prayed and they 
refuse to let them pray in Jesus' name? Does that happen in America? It's been happening. I was invited to pray at an event not real long ago. And uh, when they invited me, they said, well, you know, we got there'll be a lot of different beliefs and things there, so kind of keep it benign. I said, you might better find somebody else. Because if it ain't about Jesus, then, it, there's, then I don't need to talk. Because if Jesus is not the beginning, the middle, and the end, then you're missing out. I praise God for pastors like Jim and Reagan and Richard and some of the ones in this area I know that stand and they're not afraid to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't preach a watered-down message. Because see, if Jesus ain't in it, they don't even talk about it. Because He is in it. Notice what, what they say. I, I, let me close with this. I done said that three times in the... Peter and John answered them because they told them to be quiet. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. You know what they had a case of? Some of you there here this morning. They had a case of I can't help myself. We need a case of I can't help myself. We need a little bit of the boldness that Peter and John had. We need a little bit of that kind of courage. We need a little bit of that relationship with Jesus that carries us to the point that I can't help myself. If you hang out with me long enough, you're going to hear about Jesus. One of my dearest friends and a sister to somebody in this room, if you're around her for more than about 30 seconds, she's going to tell you Jesus loves you. You can come through the cleaners to pick your clothes up and you're going to hear, Jesus loves you. D.L. Moody made a comment. If Christians spend enough time in the Word and with Jesus, they'd have a good case if I can't help myself. Because I'm going to tell them about the Savior I know. Because don't you want everybody to know? I'm not asking for a show of hands, but is there somebody you know that you wish knew Jesus as their Savior? We all do. Oh, we need to get on our knees and pray for that person. Look for an opportunity. See, God may not open the opportunity for me to share the one on my mind, but He may bring Janet along, and if she misses out, then they might have missed out on that opportunity. We need a case of I can't help myself. We need to walk with God enough that I just can't help how many of you ever went on vacation and couldn't wait to get back and tell somebody about it? Or you remember when you were as a child and, and after Christmas break was over and you get back to school, what's the first thing as kids you talked about after Christmas? Let me tell you what I got. Let me tell you what I got. Well, let me tell you what I got. I got a Savior that can meet all your needs. That's what we need in our lives. A little bit of that I can't help myself. I'm going to tell you about what I got. That's what Peter and John had. Have you got a case of that? Well, let's hope it gets contagious for us around here. Heavenly Father, I thank You this morning for the opportunity just to consider Your Word. Lord, I don't know the hearts of everyone in this room. Lord, I don't know the hearts of any in this room. You do. Lord, and each one knows their own heart. Lord, I pray if there's not one here that if there's one here that does not know You as Savior, that today will be the day of salvation. Today will be the day they choose You as their Savior. Lord, if there's those here that, that know You as Savior, but have just kind of felt silent about that relationship of what they know and what they've seen in their own lives, Lord, would You rekindle that fire in our heart? Lord, give us that that case of I can't help myself, I'm going to share what I know and what I've seen to the world around us.